Yes. Have you heard the good news? God loves you. God loves you. And so do I. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Who does God want you to unite with to fulfill the purpose that God has in your life? Ultimately, you can't do it by yourself. You can only go so far alone, and then you'll need somebody. Don't allow your pride to block your blessing. Don't allow pride and make you believe that, no, I can do it by myself. I don't need any help. Don't let that block the blessing that God has for you. One of the most difficult things I found in my life was to ask for help and then to accept help. It takes pride to humble yourself. And someone offers you something. To, my mother says to take it. Be willing to humble yourself and receive. Because the same way that you can receive is the way that we give. When you can receive something, you're able to give that very thing that you have received. Amen. Let's look at number one. The local church is God's gift to believers. The greatest gift is the church. When you have a local church family, that means that you should never suffer lack. In the New Testament, the Bible says they sold their possessions. Each one of them sold whatever they had so that they could pour, out, pour out to everyone and nobody suffered lack anywhere. Can you imagine what it would be like if a church sold everything, everybody in the church sold everything and poured it out so that everybody was taken care of? Can you imagine what kind of a vision and what kind of heart it would take to make sure that, the, that no one in our church suffers lack? I think that's a church that people would want to become part of and want to give toward because when you come into a church like that, you will feel the love of God. Because the only thing that can compel you to give that much is God's love. When you're part of a local church, you're also part of a fellowship of believers. You learn from those around you who may know more about the Bible than you do, may know more about your Christian walk, may have been where you have been. And you can talk to fellow believers and they can help walk you along the path where you are. But that cannot happen outside the fellowship of the church. Let's look at John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer. John 17 and 1. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Keep in your name. Unity God was speaking of. It spoke earlier about the anointing that was poured on Aaron's beard and it came and flowed throughout his garments. The anointing in those days was not just a, a small anointing of oil. When they anointed the priests in those days, they took the flask and they poured the whole flask onto the priests. And the flask would cover his hair and his beard and throughout his garments. It would cover his whole body. That's what the anointing represented, the covering. And when you're anointed by God, you are covered by God. But not just you, your family is covered. Your workplace is covered. Amen. When you go into your workplace tomorrow, you're blessing the workplace. Amen. When you enter into someone's house, you're blessing the home that you enter. Amen. People should be inviting you more often to their home. Wherever you go, the anointing of God goes with you. And there's a presence that should be felt when a true believer who really knows God walks into a place. Yes. The anointing walks in yes. with you. Yes. It's like the light that comes into a dark place. Yes. People come around you because they need that light that only you can yes. provide them. And your light is not about you. It's not about your personality. Yes. The light that shines from you is from your relationship yes. with Jesus Christ. Yes. The Bible says let your light shine before men Amen. that they may see not you, when your true light is shining, they began to see Jesus Christ. Amen. And they began to give him glory. It's not your glory. That when you go into a place, light needs to shine in that place. Bless every place that you go, because that place needs a blessing. 
And if you know Jesus Christ, act like you know him. Yeah. The world needs to know that you really are a child of God. Yeah. It's all right to be a child of God. People need the blessing and the goodness of Jesus Christ that you have. Amen. And the world will never get to know him unless we share him with the world. Yes. As Cassie said earlier, imagine wrapping a gift and never giving it to someone. God's gift is wrapped up inside of every believer. But it, wasn't, it wouldn't work unless we give it and share it with somebody else who needs that gift. Amen. The love of God is the gift that just keeps giving. And the more you give, the more God gives to you. Amen. Can you imagine having so much love that you, you just don't know what to do with it? You just got so much, so much love that you can just love unconditionally? That's how God loves us. God has so much love for each of us. He knows all of our faults, yes. all of our weaknesses, all of our little quirks. And imagine God still loving us with all that. He knows all of your faults and he still loves you. When you don't even love yourself sometimes, know that God still loves you. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross. He didn't die for people that were saved and he didn't die for people that had it all together. So the fact that you don't have it all together, you're in good company. Nobody in here has it all together, beginning with your pastor. Nobody has it all together. But together, we can have it all. With unity, your gift, with someone else's gift. And we put all these gifts together. What a great, great world we can serve. But God uses the collective gifts that we have to ultimately change the world. Number two, love is the most important thing that a believer is called upon to do. Love is the most important thing. Why is that? Because God is love. First John 4 and 8 says God is love. He who loves is of God. And he who loves knows God. God so loved you and I that he gave us his only son. And Jesus' love for us commended us so that he died on the cross. How will people know that you're a child of God? By your love. The Bible says by your love. They will know you. Not by your cross. Not by the scriptures that you yes. quote. Yes. Not by what church you go to. Yes. Because we can become amen and holy and hallelujah. and we can, it, that's, not, that's not how they know you as a Christian. They know you by your love. Amen. That's a fruit that you bear as a child of God. Yes. When you bear the fruit of love, genuine love, people know now there's something about you that's different. Yes. It's like if you ever had true fruit, you might have grew up on a farm and you taste fruit that's been ripened by staying attached to the vine. A thing attached to the tree, that's different than the fruit you buy in the grocery stores. Amen? Amen? Because when you get it at the grocery store, many of that fruit is picked green. It's picked so that by the time it gets to the grocery store, it's ripened. But it has ripened by the aging process. Not ripened because it was attached to the vine. See, when the fruit is attached to the vine and ripens, it has all the goodness and nourishment. Everything is in it that's needed to be. So when you're attached to God and you show love to someone, that's love that's a genuine and true and sincere love. Yes. That's a capacity of love that you can't get anywhere else without it being attached to God. Yes. And when you have that genuine and sincere love, people know that that's real. Yes. There's a love that we learn by just maturing in Christ. We can learn to love people. You know, I, I love you like I love the Lord. But when you really genuinely love people, you can love them unconditionally. Amen. You can love the hell out of people. Yes. You can just love them in spite of them. Amen. No matter what they can do and what they can say, you just keep loving them. Amen. That's what true, genuine love does. But it also changes people. Yes. Once a person's got a hold of something that is true and genuine and right, it changes you. Yes. The love of God can change. It can melt cold hearts. Yeah. It can bring people back together again. Yeah. It can take toughness and make it tender. Yeah. It's the love of God that can only do what God can do. Yes. That's something that you can't get by reading your word. Amen. You get that in relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. That he loved you so much that he died for you. He gave you his only son. God gave you his only son. And God says, by this they will know you. 
What I'm saying is as a child of God, you're only what people can identify you to be. Have people identified you to be a child of God? If they look at you and they can see the love of all of you, and have they called you a Christian? Has the world identified you? Not, not you calling yourself. What does the world know you as? Something about you should compel people to ask you, are you a Christian? Yes. Are you a child of God? Something about the way you carry yourself. Something about, about what you do and what you don't do. What you say and what you don't say. Places you go and places you don't go eventually draws them to Jesus Christ. Amen. But it's the fruit that people will know you by. Amen. And by that fruit, the Bible says, they will identify you. It's not you calling yourself a Christian. In fact, a lot of times people just come into my office doing business, and when they say, well, I'm a Christian, I say, okay, here goes. <laughs> because I should be able to say you're a Christian. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Someone else should be able to say you're a child of God. When you have to identify yourself, that's like a tree says, I'm an orange tree. <laughs> if you've got fruit, people know what kind of tree you are. Yes, yes, yes. Anyone would know, and if you really have the fruit of God coming from you, they would know that you yes, are a child yes, of God. Yes. So the question, what is happening to your fruit? Are you bearing the fruit that others need? Because people need the fruit that's coming from you. Yes. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And when that joy comes from you, people are partaking of your joy. Your goodness, your kindness, your love, your patience, your peace are all fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And when people can partake of that from you, they now know that you are a child of God. Because you can have peace in unpeaceful situations. You can love even when people don't love you. Yes. You can show grace and mercy and goodness yes. and kindness in situations that is unkind. Yes. And you can only do that if you really know Jesus Christ is your Lord yes. and Savior. Yes. You can't do that if you just read the scripture yes. and you just go to church once in a while. Yes. That can only come from you knowing who Jesus Christ yes. really is. They would come to Jesus and many of them came because of what Jesus had to offer them. Many of them did not come for Jesus. Don't do that. Don't just come for what Jesus has for you. Come for him. Yeah. And the Bible says if you seek him with your whole heart, you will find him. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6 says, He who comes to God must know that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. <laughs> he who comes to God must know that he is. When Moses Ask God, who shall I tell them? When they ask me, who is sending me? God says, tell them I am that I am. I am that. Whatever you're seeking, God says, I am that. Whatever's missing, God says, I am that. Whatever you need, God says, I am that. He who comes to God must know that God is that. Yes. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Yes. Now my question is, are you diligently seeking God? Are you seeking God's hand? Or are you seeking God's heart? If you're turning from yourself and toward God, are you wanting God to bless your mess? Because when you really want God, God knows and yes. God wants you. But the Bible says you have to diligently, diligently seek him. Then you will find him. Number three, when God's people live together in unity, they experience God's blessing. Amos chapter number three and verse number three. Amos three and three says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Can two walk together unless they are agreed? How many people take walks in your neighborhood? Anybody take walks? Have you ever noticed the things that you see when you're walking that you don't notice when you drive? When you're walking in your neighborhood, even to walk in your community, you'll find there's things that you notice when you're walking that you cannot notice when you drive. And when you're walking with someone and you're talking with them, there are things you find out as you're sharing that you just can't share when you're driving. The conversation is differently when you're walking. But the Bible says you can't walk together, genuinely walk together, unless you are in agreement. Kim and I, when we first got, well, first started dating, we went on a few road trips. 
And road trips is how you get to know people. Amen? Amen. You may like them at the beginning of the road trip. <laughs> but after being on a six-hour drive and getting tired and hungry and having to make stuff, things starts coming out. <laughs> but when you can walk together and be in agreement, that shows promise. When you can spend time together and you can go on a road trip together and you can come out feeling good about it, that shows promise. When you get on a road trip and halfway there you want to push the other person out, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't go all the way. Maybe we should have flown. We should have taken that flight. But the Bible says, can you walk together, truly and genuinely walk together unless you are in agreement? You should be seeking unity. Unity is what God wants. Not just agreeing to disagree. Not just saying things that you can appease the other person. Unity means one heart, one mind, one spirit, one love, and one God. When you truly have unity, you're seeking unity in all aspects of your life. Can two walk together lest they be agreed? It's difficult to walk together with people that you don't agree with. In fact, when people that you don't like come around you, the first thing you say is don't touch me. You don't want people to be around you that you cannot in agreement with. But if you are able to find common points of interest, whatever you have disagreements, find your common point of interest. That's the place where you can navigate back to your area of agreement. Whenever Kim and I had talked about if we were ever in a place where we were separated, physically, going to a real crowded place, I go to some place and she goes this direction, I go that direction, We'll always go back to the last place that we were when we saw each other and we'll wait there. No matter where she is, I just go back and I'll wait or she'll wait. I know where she's going to be. I just stay there and I wait. When you have disagreements and something separates you, go back to your point of agreement and just wait. God will settle differences if you just find your point of agreement and wait at your point of agreement. Unity means what can we agree about? Satan loved disunity and disharmony. He loved to separate people. This person over here, this person over there, even in the same house, one person on this part of the house, so another person over here. But we have to come together. Unity is in finding common ground. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. 10, 25. That forsaken, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as the day as we see the day approaching. Assembling of yourselves together. Some people don't assemble at the church because they feel the church doesn't work for them. I've gone to churches, just not for me. You know, when we find that the church really was never meant to be for us, the church has always been about Jesus Christ. And when we come into the church with him in mind, not ourselves in mind, we begin to experience more of him. Amen. The worship experience is about experiencing God. Amen. When you hear the word of God, it's the word of God being spoken for you. But up until you hear the word of God, the worship, the praise is all for God. Yeah. That tills your soil. It prepares you for the word. When you open up your heart with praise and worship, your heart is now ready to receive the word of God. But if you don't come in, if you don't worship God, if you don't give God praise and give God glory, it's hard for the word that I can preach to penetrate that exterior, that hard, that tough soil of yours. Open up your heart and let God come in, but you do that through praise and through worship. Amen. Even when I'm tired, I, I have to worship God more. Yes. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're having a rough time, you don't feel like worshiping, you need to worship God more. Amen. Amen. When it's hardest to pray, that's when you should pray the hardest. That's when you need God the most. Amen. And when praises goes up, yes. God inhabits the place where your praise was. Yes. If you've got something that you're dealing with, praise your way through it. Amen. And as you praise through it, God starts inhabiting the place where he needs to be in your life. See, God knows where he needs to be. God knows exactly where he needs to be in your life. But you want to put God where you want to put him. But when we start praising God and opening up our heart, God comes in and he fixes yes. the thing that you need most. Yes, but you have to trust God and let God lead. We say God is our co-pilot. 
We need to swap seats. God's a better pilot. God's a better pilot than a co-pilot. We need to swap seats and let God lead. And God can navigate you to places that you could never navigate to by yourself. Amen? Amen. Number three. Number four. I knew that. Number, th number four. The anointing of oil signifies that God covers us from head to toe. Covers us from head to toe. So let's look at Psalms 127 and verse number one as I close. Um, unless the Lord builds a house. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. I grew up in Louisiana and Mississippi. And all those little shacks that we grew up in, the house was sitting on blocks. And the winds would come and storms and hurricanes would come. And I don't know what made those houses stand. Because they weren't built with that in mind. But I had a mother who loved the Lord. My mother anointed the place that we live. Yes. It's the foundation of that anointing yes. that allowed storms to pass over. Yes. Yes, Lord. It's not the construction of a house that makes it stand, it's the anointing. Praise God. It's not how beautiful your house is and your design is the anointing of God. Yes, it is. When you have the anointing covering you, it covers your household and everything about you. And you don't know why you're able to stand, but you're standing because of the anointing of God. Yes, Lord. We have a friend who have a house in Prescott. And there was a fire in Prescott. And it was right in the area where his house was. And if you know in Prescott, you go out there, there's just trees and pines everywhere. And whenever things start to burn, everything burns in the vicinity. And when he saw the fire on TV and he knew that it was there and it showed the devastation, he knew that his house was destroyed. He didn't even go up for weeks later. And after several weeks, he went to see the destruction. But what he noticed that when he got there, that it burned up to his house and around his house. It burnt the next house, but didn't burn his house. The anointing of God protects you Hurricanes will come and they'll blow over some houses. Why do hurricanes stop? That's not the order in which they move, but the anointing covers that house. I'm telling you, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord is there in your house and the anointing of God is there, you labor in vain. It's not about your relationship with other people. You can know your doctor, you can know your architect, you can know your builder, you can know your contractor, but if you don't know God, your house will be built in vain. Yes. Unless the Lord truly builds a house, you will labor in wondering why is it that things are always happening? Because you built your house with you in mind. When you build a house, you have to build your house with God in mind. Yes. And when you build your house with God in mind, God becomes the foundation that everything rests upon. Yes. And when you lay that foundation on Jesus Christ, then everything that happens to the house will have to go through that foundation. And if you're there, you can watch things pass over. And you can give God glory as the storm is passing over, as the flood is passing over, as the rain is passing over, as the wind is passing over. You can have peace because the anointing of God is there. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it will labor in vain. Thank you, God for your work.